Yeah, since the record session has just started, um, it's two o'clock. Uh, the, that's the time that we had set aside to start the webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and mute the participants that are here now, and then we're just gonna stand by five minutes for um, any stragglers to join us, which most people come midways through or a couple minutes after we start, and then we'll go ahead and start talking about this topic. And for those those of you guys that are muted, um, I think you just dialed in, so um, hmm, uh, we're gonna have to figure out how can I know that you want to say something if you can't unmute yourself, but you ought to be able to unmute yourself. Okay, guys, um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started, uh, and I appreciate you guys taking the time um, to, yeah, I appreciate you guys taking the time to join in on the session. Right now, it's just three, I think maybe four of us, if I'm looking at this right, um, but since there's not that many of us here yet, I just have everybody unmuted. If it starts to build up in numbers, um, as it normally does, um, and we start to get any of that ambient noise out there, I'll go ahead and mute everybody and unmute folks as need be. Um, again, the session is being recorded, so um, if you just dialed in right now and you're able to go online um, later on and look at our uh, website, you'll be able to see the actual charts that we're going to be going through um, as we talk through the topic of the reason or the excuse and knowing the, the difference. And again, this is the Million Mentors March webinar, and we try to hold these quarterly, and we try to change topics. Um, and I just want to welcome you guys, and thanks for your time. And on the topic of excuses, people make time for things that they want to do, and we'll get more into that. And so I just can't say enough thanks for making the time to come here and sharing your insights. Because what we're actually doing here, and um, you know, not to go off topic, I was listening to a Dr. Umar Johnson a couple weeks ago, and he was talking about all of the Black Lives Matter protests, and you know, and some of the rioting that goes on out there. Um, but the question is, what are we gaining from it? What What are we doing? What are we actually doing? And there's always, um, you know, something to be gained when you get out and speak out. And if anything, you're telling your story. But what we're doing here at Million Mentors March is we're build, building a, a resource service or center online at our website, www.millionmentorsmarch.org. And on that site, you can go to the lectures tab if you're a young parent or a young adolescent or just a young person in general, and you can learn insights from uh, proven people about very important topics such as critical thinking and resiliency and accountability. So, uh, and the reason, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is, um, is because, um, you know, I remember being 21 years old, my daughter was born. Okay, she was born, my wife stayed in the hospital about two or three days and then poof, pow, okay, you guys, you're discharged, you go home. And they just sent us home. 
with this brand new person. And I was at the time uh, 21 years old. My wife was 22. And I'm thinking to myself, man, we don't get any, any an instruction manual or class or something. I don't know what to do. I can really mess this person up. You know, and, you know, I think that's kind of um, crazy that, that things are done that way because so many people teach hatred to their children. So many people don't teach their children anything at all. So we just wanted to put together a resource center for people to go to and have talk, find talking points, things they can sit down and talk to their kids about, things they can sit down and talk to their mentees about. So this week we're just going to build on what we talked about um, last webinar, which was accountability. And again, I'm Gus Wright, uh, site founder, and I don't know if Amir can make it today. He's probably still reuniting with his family. He just got back from Africa. And uh, he uh, is the co-founder of the site so I'm just going to press forward here. Um, last webinar, just like I said, we talked about accountability. And um, again, I'm Gus Wright. And since that webinar, lots of things have happened surrounding the topic of accountability. As you all know, Alton Sterling was killed by the Baton Rouge police, uh, and it was caught on camera. Philando Castell, uh, same type of deal. He was a licensed carrier um, of a, a firearm and he followed all protocol but still ended up being killed by a cop and then another questionable situation uh, by Miss Corin Gaines in Baltimore she ended up being killed by police and her five-year-old son was shot in the process and that story um, in itself is very questionable as we progress through um, through this uh, session one thing that I want to do is um, is get some insight from from the people. Get your thoughts, you know, after you learn some more about um, what I'm thinking, and contribute your thoughts about uh, reasons versus excuses. Okay, so let's press forward. Okay, basically, what is an excuse? What is a reason? Okay, and to me, this is a very hairy topic because um, reasons can sometimes be used as excuses and you know after extensive research um, I've found a lot of people have a lot of different um, thoughts about reasons and excuses and uh, some people have these uh, what they call solutions or, or no-brainers on how to point out an excuse over a reason but me personally I think there's never a half-baked solution you know as Dr. MLK would call it you have to think and uh, critically approach every situation and determine each case by case. Some people will say if you ever use the word but in a, in a statement or a rebuttal, then it's probably an excuse. Well, that's true sometimes, but it's not true all of the time. And as many of you know, I'm big on words and semantics, so we're going to go over a couple definitions uh, as we press forward. And again, it's open discussion. Feel free if you're on the line to unmute yourself and uh, share your thoughts uh, to the con contribute your thoughts to the conversation. Okay, so basically excuse. Um, an excuse is an attempt to lessen blame associated with a fault or an offense. You seek to defend or justify, seeking, seeking to release oneself or someone else from accountability, from being accountable. That's what an excuse is. A um, good example of that would be uh, asking the kid, hey, why don't you want to go to bed? It's time for you to go to bed. And the kid's saying, well, my TV show is on. And then you say, well, you know, you can watch it tomorrow, and then they'll come with something else. Um, uh, like, well, I'm not tired. You know, and the list goes on and on and on. So one good way to identify an excuse is if uh, one answer doesn't satisfy the question if you have to keep building and building and building and a reason on the other hand is an explanation of why something is the way it is with everyone involved taking accountability for their part in the situation everyone involved taking accountability and we talked about accountability last time and you know just like I gave another example um, a better rebuttal for asking a kid hey uh, why don't you want to go to bed the, the truth the reason would be I don't want to. I just don't want to. I mean, that that in itself will satisfy the need. Even though it may not be accepted by the parent, there may be some backlash, but that's the true reason. And that's the difference between an excuse, um, one of the differences between an excuse and how to identify. And we, we're going to delve a little deep into this, but before we do that, I'm going to press forward a little bit and just revisit accountability as we talked about it in the last session. Last session when we talked about accountability, we broke it down into four parts, which is personal accountability, 
that's the responsibility for your own actions, your own competence, your own obligations, and following through. That's our personal accountability. And that's only one piece. Then there's accountability for your friends, being your brother's keeper and your sister's keeper, and keep them honest, keep them competent, and keep them safe. That's another part. And then there's community accountability, establishing, upholding, and abiding by community standards. Okay? And those are three parts uh, that I have highlighted in red. For those of you just doubting, you may not be able to see, but I build on, I'm building on what we talked about last time. They're highlighted in red because those three parts encompass us what we can do as a community, you know. But in order for accountability to be holistic, there has to be some external factor here as well. That's society's public accountability, society's responsibility to us and our, and our responsibility to society. So that's a little bit of us, but it's also them. And when you it – can't, it can never be just, just me, me, me. That, that's also us or just them, them, them. You know, you can't ever place the blame on, on one or the other. You, you can't let yourself off the hook. You should never let the other factors off the hook, meaning public. So when you put all those together, you have accountability. And that's a part of uh, what I perceive as being the problem um, going on now, a lack of accountability, lack of holistic accountability. Okay? And the definition of accountability is the quality or state of being accountable, especially an obligation or willingness to accept responsibility or to account for one's actions. Okay, now, if you remember on the previous slide, uh, um, I was saying that um, a reason has accountability. Uh, accountability is always associated with a reason. You are being accountable. You're accepting responsibility, and you are holding other external factors accountable as well. Everyone is being held accountable. And in the end, what that does is it provides context. And context is very important because context um, – and I'm going to talk about the semantic, the definition of context as well. But context, uh, it, it promotes understanding and empathy. And it gives a person a full picture so that they can make a, a more clear, a concise judgment in a situation. So the definition of context is basically the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement or idea, and in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. Okay, what I'm gearing towards is I'm building to cultural context. And in order to understand what cultural context is, let's talk about what culture is. Culture is relating to the ideas, the customs, and social behavior of members of a society. Now, let's focus here. We're talking now about the black community, our culture. Okay, cultural context refers to factors that surround a community's condition. What is the condition of the black community? right now? What is the condition of self, each member of the black community right now? But it may not be stated explicitly. You have to open your eyes and you have to listen to the full context. And this is background information. It informs our deeper understanding of the circumstances in question and allows us to analyze rather than summarize why we are the way we are. And it is important to be aware of what a community is experiencing in their time and what they're reacting to and reacting against. And that all makes up cultural context. Cultural context will allow you to give a clear reason versus an excuse. It'll allow you to give a clear reason versus an excuse. And that provides enough context to evoke empathy and also to give a reason that stands alone on its own without having to continue to build and compile excuses. Okay, on this chart here, which, like, again, those of you just listening in, you won't be able to see, but I'm talking about uh, the young lady, no last name was given, Shakira, who was uh, thrown out of her desk by a cop, and I think it was Spring Valley or some town like that. Um, you know, just looking at the video, um, most people would say, um, well, you know, she resisted arrest or... What did she do leading up to that event? You know, and that video provides no context, especially no cultural context, okay? A little cultural context to add to that uh, situation will be the fact that she's a foster child. And some statistics on foster kids, 24% of foster children struggle with disabilities while in school, learning disabilities, um, 
and, and even sometimes physical disabilities. And 52% of foster children, foster youth, attend schools that rank in the lowest percentile. Hence is why instead of having, instead of having a, a guidance counselor um, available as a resource to the teachers who are experiencing a problem with a student, you have a resource cop, a police officer, contributing to you know what many, such as Dr. Umar Johnson, referred to as the prison pipeline. You know, things like detention and in-house, uh, you know, what I call practice jail, you know. And, you know, you look at third world countries and you'll notice that they'll call something like, you know, the, the Turkish prison, one of the worst prisons to be in. And, and, you know, and it's because they don't have these kinds of things in their school system. And when a person encounters prison, it's the first time they're encountering such a thing. And that's why they'll call it worse when it's probably really no worse than what's in America. Um, and you know, I could be wrong, but this, these are just my thoughts on it. Whereas American kids, especially inner city black kids, you know, these kids are exposed to being detained, detention, you know, it's a root word, being detained and segregated, just like being put in segregation when you're in jail. They, they, they are uh, being groomed for jail. So jail isn't, you know, something that's new to them by the time they get there. It's the prison pipeline, you know. And I don't want to digress into that. We're going to get more into reasons. Um, and before I move forward, anybody have any thoughts to contribute to that? Okay. And here I have another young lady, um, an eight-year-old child who was placed in handcuffs um, in school because uh, she had a temper tantrum in the classroom and started tearing things up, you know, and that's the context that most people will be given, and, you know, and, you know, most people will come back and say, okay, well, she shouldn't have been acting out in school. But remember, we want to give a reason for this, and I don't want to let anybody off the hook, but, you know, accountability is an is a, is, is a all-encompassing thing, you know, as we described. is us and them. Now, let's say this child is us. Her role, her responsibility, because that's what accountability is also, was to let the teacher know, hey, I have to go to the restroom. This child here, also eight years old, also a foster child, and, you know, and she's uh, privy to all the things I just discussed statistically to what happens and what the mindset and what the limitations of foster children is. She went to the teacher and said, hey, I have to use the restroom. Now she fulfilled her obligation. When you have to go to the restroom at eight years old, you let someone know. The teacher ignored her, didn't allow her to go, and short time later the child had a temper tantrum. Now, if we let this teacher off the hook, now hold her accountable because her responsibility is to see that the child is able to relieve herself, is able to focus in school, and to also know a little bit about the child's background because there's no cookie-cutter solution to educating someone. You have to know something about the person. Take the time. You know, she didn't fulfill her responsibility, and I'm never going to say that it's acceptable for a child to destroy a classroom, but the context, you know, will give you the opportunity to say, you know, after, after taking these things into consideration, I think um, the reason behind this helps me to understand this child a little bit more, and I can better empathize with the child. Now, that's a little bit on the difference between reasons and uh, excuses. And then that's also a little bit about cultural context, okay? Before we move on, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to pull up a, a, a short video. I hope you guys can hear it. Uh, if you can't, let me know, but it'll be a part of the video. And it's by uh, Kakanza Nuri Robbins. And um, she's talking about cultural context and why it's so important. We cannot engage authentically or effectively with people if we think there is no context, if we think that this is a blank slate, if we think that this is culturally unbiased or that we have removed all cultural elements from the engagement. If you think that, it only means that you are part of the dominant culture and this is your culture, this is your pool that we are swimming in, and these are your rules that we are working by. And so it's important to understand that even though you may have just met me, that you have in the past met people who might look like me, who might sound like me, 
who might dress like me. You may have met people in the past with whom you've had wonderful experiences, with whom you've had horrible experiences. You have been taught that people who look like me believe certain things have certain lifestyles, engage in certain ways, that you should be afraid of some of us, that you should love some others of us. And so for me to presume that you're not doing any of that is for me to set myself up for a very ineffective interaction. And so the cultural context is important. We cannot... Okay. That's uh, Kikanzi Nere Robbins on cultural context. Um, and that's just to build on what I was just talking about. Um, and, you know, to, to press forward a little bit. Um, for those of you listening, you can't see this, but I have on here a timeline, um, a timeline of America and American slavery. And this timeline starts at 1619. And it states that slavery began in 1619 and lasted 246 years up until 1865 when they were emancipated. Then after that, uh, here's another little insight, uh, 1865 or somewhere around about that time is also the time when the American uh, prison system came into place and when uh, petty crimes like loitering and uh, vagrancy became uh, criminal offenses that could get you put into prison and placed on the chain gang and put back into the same bondage that you were in in slavery. Okay, that's just a little uh, context, a little historic tidbit on that. Then after slavery, then there came segregation. 89 years of segregation, then around 1964 was the end of Jim Crow. And then after that, 52 years ensued up until 2016. Here's where we are now. Okay, cumulatively, you're talking 300 or some plus years of uh, black people not being able to just leave and get a job. Black people not being able to read, not being able to buy a home where they wanted to, not being able to shop where they want to, invest where they want to not being able to learn, educate themselves, you know, and hence one of the reasons for uh, historically black universities. Now, you'll, what you have up top on this chart, and again, like I said, then only 52 years, after 300 plus years, only 52 years, only 52 years to do the things that most people will say we need to do in order to uh, remedy our current condition in the black community. You know, all the killing, all the poverty. You know, most people will say, well, why don't you just go to college? Why don't you just get a job? Why don't you stop doing crime? Why don't you stop killing each other? Now, I don't excuse any of these things. Make no mistake. I don't excuse any of them. But the reason for most of these things is laid out right before you on this timeline. We need accountability, which means that, you know, us, we need to do some things. We need to continue to work. And we also need for them, public, the public, you know, to make amends and accept responsibility to what was done to black people throughout history within America. And we also need more time. 52 years, you know, I mean, just mathematically, it's not equivalent to 300 plus years. You, know, you can't do those sorts of things uh, to people and expect them just to go to college now, get a job. Stop doing crime. Stop killing each other. You know, there's no excuse for those things, but here's a reason, not the reason. This is a reason that I've come up with for why, you know, we are the way we are, our current condition, our current cultural context. So, you know, when people watch this on our website and, you know, have a discussion with their kids, you're going to be asked these things, you know, and especially when you make it somewhere. Why don't your people just go to college? You know, there are a lot of people... And, you know, it's not really their fault because the school system don't really teach black history beyond, you know, there was slavery. Then there was a guy named Martin Luther King who saved all the black people he had a dream. They don't go into the depths, you know, especially when it comes to ramifications, cause and effect of such atrocities laid out here before you. A lot of people will come at you that way. Well, here's a reason. This one reason will stand alone. We need accountability by us and them, and we need more time. 
you know, to correct ourselves, to get ourselves to where we need to be. And there's an article, and I'll give a link to that later on in this, in the Wall Street Journal, um, shared by Your Black World as well, uh, um, Dr. Boyce Watkins and his team, that talks about, you know, an analysis that the World Wall Street Journal did that states that it will take 228 plus years in order for uh, African Americans to catch up to our Caucasian counterparts in America in wealth and capital. And, and it will, because you look at 1865, we were displaced people. Yesterday, we were on Master's Plantation, and that was where we lived. That was where we ate whatever he gave us. That was where we clothed ourselves and our family. Now, suddenly, you know, legally, Mr. Slave, Mrs. Slave, I can't hold you here anymore. But all the capital, all the land, it still belongs to me. But you, you, can, you can decide to leave or you can decide to stay and work for me and I'll give you what I can. Hence, capitalism uh, began. And like I said, the prison system also began. So this, this is the reason, okay? If anybody ever asks you, why don't you just go to college? Why don't you get a job? Why don't you stop doing crime? Why don't they stop killing each other? And one other thing that I want to point out it's, no, I don't let our people off the hook. We should try hard and we should work hard, but we do need some help. You know, we need some accountability by the public, you know, in, in order for, for us to, to, to catch up a little faster and to get ourselves to where we need to be. But, you know, it's, it's, it's something to think about, you know, because you have to remember that there are exceptional people among us and everyone isn't exceptional. Everyone's not Michael Jordan. Everybody's not going to be able to shoot threes like Steph Curry. You know, everyone's not, you know, as brilliant as Oprah Winfrey and it's going to just uh, get themselves um, extremely wealthy within one, one lifetime. You know, and I don't want to be dooming saying that, hey, you're going to work your whole life and you're not going to have anything and maybe your great grandkids will have something if they continue to push forward, but that's the reality of it. You know, if, if you're a normal person, and most people don't overcome, you know, such adversity. So this is why we need uh, certain programs in place, historically black universities, so on and so forth, and affirmative action in certain universities and work industries. Any thoughts on this before we press forward? Hey, guys. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You hit the nail right on the head. There's... Um, there's reasons. I don't think there's an excuse at this day and age for anything. It's um, it's like an old saying we have in the army: the maximum effective range of an excuse is 0, 0.0 meters. Absolutely. And when you look at our culture, our society, you know, this is this is our timeline. If I call my 13-year-old right now and ask him about our history, he thinks it started when they started putting us on boats. He has no no view of it beyond that, you know, beyond that. When you look at the, I don't want to call it the plight of our community, but when you look at particular demographics, it's like they box them in. It's like psychologically, we're raised, we've got the last two or three generations have been psychologically boxed in. Like, you look at 1865 when slavery ended, now we're free. What do we do now? You know, and we start... Yeah playing a catch-up game, but they put more obstacles in our way. You look at, you know, civil rights movement, um, end of Jim Crow. You know, they went, well, now they can't blatantly do these things to us, but they still psychologically continue to do them. You come to now, you come to right now here today, where we stand. There is elements, I, I like to call it psychological class warfare, because they have figured out a way to exploit, demean, like just base break us down. Like there's, you know, um, there's reasons why we are the way we are, and this timeline is it. And there's also reasons why we're stuck in this perpetual cycle of violence. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are definitely 
reasons. And, you know, we can go into detail about, you know, the welfare system and the housing projects and how, you know, the black family, I'm sorry, the black mm-hmm. family and the black man was systemically removed from the black household, even though, you know, there's some culpability on the black man's and also, but, you know, um, a lot of women took the cheese, you know, they took the, the mm-hmm. cheese, uh, you know, figuratively speaking, that's placed on the rat trap. Sure. You know, I would put food stamps if you don't have this man in your house, you know, mm-hmm. and then you get a bunch of boys, and then you get a bunch of boys who grow up and with no male figure and a bunch of trifling guys who are out of sight and out of mind because they're not going to fight that, you know, they're not going to make a way to still be a part of their, their, their kids' lives. And then you have a lopsided uh, household and, and kids lacking the resilience skills, resiliency skills, the critical thinking skills that's necessary to continue to progress. And it slows progression. You know, those 52 years will be, will probably be a decent amount of time if, you know, there weren't so many setbacks and that, that altered and halted our progression, you know, as a people, you know, because when you got people with no capital, like you say, just get a job. Okay, well, who's going to give me a job? You know, yeah. it, capital means, I'm talking real capital, that means, you know, you, you own something. You own some land, you own some property, you own a business where you can go out and, uh, you know, strike up a deal with a, a large corporation and say, hey, I can uh, provide logistics for you. Most black people don't own that kind of capital. You know, it's going to take some time to develop that. But we are educated in school to be consumers. You know, we, we're, we're not educated to, to say, you know, I hence, uh, you know, we're doing a, a, a very positive thing right now, a webinar, and we got four people in attendance, but Black Friday you can't get in Walmart. You know, we, we, we are... We are conditioned to be consumers. You know, we don't save anything. We don't understand money. We look at it in the wrong way. We don't use it like a resource. We definitely don't understand wealth the way that we should. You know, and these are the sorts of things that will definitely stifle the progression and development of a people. But here's the cultural context to back that. And within the red, there are things like, uh, you know, we've talked about in other webinars, uh, the Willie Lynch mindset. Willie Lynch promised that his methods will work for thousands of years to come, and he's absolutely right. You know, you put mm-hmm. old against young, and young against old, fat against skinny, tall against short, light skin against dark skin. Nowadays, on my news feed, I'm getting somebody getting shot in Savannah, Georgia, every day because of the same thing. You know, the same nonsense. You on my street, you doing this, you selling my drugs, or I don't like the way you look. I don't like the clothes you got on, you know, that all of that kind of stuff. Don't talk to my woman, you know, don't say nothing to my child. Whereas, you know, th- we need to be working together to help raise each other's children. There's a young man who just got killed in Savannah um, by a jealous boyfriend because he was uh, stepping up and taking care of the child, you know, and granted, you know, there's some culpability on all ends, you know, accountability, you know, the way things were handled that winded up, you know, culminating in this person's life being being lost, but it takes a village to raise a child. You should be happy that someone's helping out with your child in your absence, mm-hmm. as long as the person is a decent person. But these things all stem from that Willie Lynch mindset that was instituted strategically on black people during this red period that I have outlined here on this timeline. And tons of other systemic uh, obstacles that were put in place uh, for, for, for our our stifling is what, what it was there for to slow us down for whatever the reason to keep us in servitude, you know, and, and we have to realize, you know, when a person comes to you and says these kind of things, give them the real reason because what you want to do is you want to provide that cultural context. We should all be disciples of our story, telling people what our story is out there. Provide that context every opportunity you get because it's going to take more than just us to help us out of our current circumstance. Any other thoughts before we press forward? Okay. And here's a link. Um, and, again, I'll leave it up for a few seconds. Uh, the, this uh, analysis done by the Wall Street Journal, it would take 228 years for black families to amass the wealth of white families. 
yeah, and analysis says. Okay, case in point, I was looking at the Olympics in Rio, and one of the uh, triathlon athletes, I'm, I forget her name, she won gold. Um, forgive me for that. She did a good job. But her whole, most of her town and both sides of her family, her uh, husband's side and her side, all put down everything. Mind you this, they're not a, Olympic athletes. She is. They put down everything, and they went to Rio to support her. How do they afford that? That's 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 a that's a heck of a question because I don't know anybody in my family that can put down everything and just come hang out and support me for a, a month and nothing that I do and they can't support me in anything that I do for a month because they need to go to work and feed themselves, you know. So that that's what this is speaking towards. If you want to read the article, um, here's a, a link to it and it ought to shift that paradigm and thinking. You know, do I need to be buying Jordans and fancy things or do I need to be saving and investing capital so that I can be a positive step in this 228 years that's necessary in propelling my family forward? You know, and that's 228 years, mind you this, that's if they were standing still. They're continuing to move forward, continuing to get richer. You know, so this is something uh, that we have to keep in mind when we're making certain decisions financially and in the way that we carry ourselves and our households and the way that we approach day-to-day -day business. Any thoughts on this before we press forward? Okay. And, uh, you know, I always try to leave with a few quotes and, you know, something, some meat, you know, to take, take us uh, – home and so that we can think things through and begin to work on ourselves and share knowledge with other people. So I want us to know the difference uh, between excuses and reasons, okay? And uh, George Washington Carver, many of you know, he was a great in inventor and uh, the inventor of peanuts, uh, peanut oil, and so on and so forth. He did a lot of great things. And uh, he says 99% um, of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses, and why I want to put that there is because um, this is why excuses and reasons are so hairy. Lots of people, lots of people will take a, a good reason, a very good reason, and twist it into becoming an excuse. You know, say for instance, if um, if I if I stayed out late after I got off work to go to a, um, a mentorship webinar or a financial wealth webinar or session. And then at the end, um, the person asked me, um, well, really, the reason why I went there is because I want to make more money or I want to learn something new. And if at the end, the person asked me, hey, why don't you um, come in every day this week and, uh, and help us out and do more for the organization? And what the person, what, what the person come back with as an excuse, man, I can't. I got to go to work. Well, the reason you went there was because you want to earn more and you want to do better but you're using your reason as an excuse now, you know, so we got to be careful with that. And here's uh, James A. Baldwin, um, great guy from the beat period, a great Renaissance writer. Uh, he talks about reasons. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. And that talks more about um, what we were talking about earlier cultural context, why we need to provide that cultural context, because you force people to have to deal with the pain that they cause. It holds them accountable, holds them accountable. You know, reasons always hold yourself and all other persons culpable accountable for their part in the current circumstance. So that's uh, George Washington Carver and James Baldwin. Okay. I just want to throw these up there and get some insight before we leave. Um, I mean, you guys can pick any one of these um, and talk about it if you want to, get it off your chest. But what do you think the reason is for, for all of these things that are happening lately and throughout history to, to African Americans? This is, uh, this is, this is probably what's eating at me most of the summer is um these these three situations right here. You look at uh 
Austin Sterling and Baton Rouge and how that situation played out. And that was like, I can't even find words to articulate. It's just, it's disgusting. It so is. You look at um, Philando Castro, Castle. You know, I'm a I'm a concealed carry person. I believe, you know, my right to I, I have to protect myself. Um, and for this young man to do everything right, and then to end up like this, this, this that's a, the reason for that was a lack was poor judgment. Um, and the last one, the last young lady, I'm not not far. I'm in Northern Virginia area, not far from where this happened. This has been the talk of the town. Um, there is a reason behind that that we may never understand what this young lady was thinking and not having we have a a one-sided view of the situation like you know hey she's on social media posting this while the situation is going on there's video footage of her with a SWAT officer in plain view like you know they have they both have a clear line of sight of each other yeah. there's ways that that situation could have been handled different it could have had a different outcome but it's 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 almost like a I say a sideshow. Our, our demise is a sideshow to America. It's 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 a they show it. We you know you look at look at the situation in Milwaukee, um, the latest one. The what happened to that young man? The reason for his death is because of his action, and no no other. He made poor decisions, and it cost him his life. Absolutely. The, response from the community was a lack of critical thinking, logic, and reasoning, because they just took it and ran with it. And then the America's response to it is totally skewed because of how the media portrayed that. There's, you know, they're seeing in footage that they doctored up, they edited and manipulated to make it sound like, you know, they at the family advocated for them to go out here and commit this stuff. Um, then there's the uncut footage, and it's like, you know, she's making a point that we don't need to do this. We don't need to be destroying our community. You know, take that mess somewhere else. And that, in context, take that mess somewhere else means, you know, go. you need to go somewhere else with that mess, saying that I'm not telling you to go burn down the next neighborhood. I'm telling you, you might want to reconsider what you're thinking about doing. And it's like, we make, for every step we take forward, we take 10 steps back. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, we can get up here. We can have, we can, we do our webinar. We have the most intellectually stimulating conversation and address the issues facing the community. But we can't go out in the community and do that. There's no, you know, those that the uh, prime, prime example, um, you look at, the successful leaders in the community that have thousands of people followers and stuff like that. If you look at who's following them, they fit a particular social economic status level of education. They yeah. may be reaching those that aspire to do better or are doing better, but we're not getting those that are down in the trenches. And that's who we're missing. There's no role models or example in the communities. There's, you know, there may be one or two people but their voice is being drowned out because all we display is negativity. Like, when's the last yeah. time we heard a positive story about our accomplishments? You know, you look at the Olympics, you know, the young lady won gold swimming. Everybody's upset because she didn't put her hand over her heart during the President of Exactly. Like, you know, and I'm like, that's kind of a – where. So, someone please show me where it says I'm supposed to place my hand over my heart, like where it's a law that says that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man, I think you hit a lot of things on the head. I mean, I think the main thing that you hit on the head is reaching the people who are down in the trenches, uh, so to speak. And, you know, who's there to mentor them? Who do they have to look up to? And with that being said, um, I think it should be the goal of every um, person that defied the odds. Because if you look at that timeline, the odds were against you. I don't care who you think you are or what you think you are. 
the odds were against you. If you somebody right now, if you got a college degree or if you got a, a good paying job somewhere, you you defy the odds, and it comes at, at multiple levels. I think the goal of most of us should be to start our own business, take that business back into our communities. And be that boss, because most of these people, man, they look up to that hand that feeds them. That's who they look up to. Be the boss who provides a job, you know, who provides, you know, a career, who provides an establishment, a place where, you know, our people can go and they don't have to ask anybody. They need to see us. They need to see more business owners that are black in our communities doing things and, you know, and, and providing resources and providing mentorship like we talked about you know, blazing the trail and showing them, you know, that uh, there's, there's more to us than our current condition, you know, and it's just like too many of us leave and never come back. We never invest anything back into our community time, if anything, you know, like what, what the three of us or four of us is doing right now. This is time for our community. And at the end, you know, we're, we're contributing to an online resource, like we said, that people can go to and have at, at least some talking points to go over with their kids to create awareness. Uh, and any other thoughts to contribute, you know, to what's going on with these people? Yeah, and these are very tragic uh, situations. And like you said, you know, accountability, you know, must be uh, held against both us and them in, in all situations. Um, and I, I don't know what Alton Sterling could have done differently. Um, you know, I just don't know what, what he could have done. I, I don't know what Fernando Castile could have done differently. You know, there's a couple things uh, Corin Gaines could have done differently. But ultimately, um, you know, they need to be held accountable, but I don't think they deserve to die um, in the situations that they were in. And the persons involved on the uh, law enforcement side of this, um, you know, those guys matter just as much as we do, but uh, we need some accountability. And, you know, both on part of the, the media as well, I think they play a huge part in the way we're, we're portrayed. You know, they, they promote fear and anxiety when it comes to black people. And I don't know why, um, you know, there's not more accountability there as well. And on us, we feed into it. We feed into it. If someone offers us a paycheck, you know, we'll say anything in a rap song or do anything on TV or on a reality series. So, you know, we got to stop valuing uh, certain things. We need to really take a hard look at our value system, you know, because personally I value safety, not being feared when I go outside. Because when someone's afraid of you, that's a dangerous situation for you, know it, whether you know it or not. And I value dignity. You know, I want to be respected, you know, when I, when I go out because I work hard, you know, and, and I study hard. You know, these are things that I value, and I definitely value fa family, and I value progression. But these aren't the things that get portrayed uh, by the media uh, for the most part when it comes to black people. So we got to start uh, looking at it like a domino game sometimes. You don't take all money. All money ain't good money, um, you know, and that's just my little soapbox uh, when it comes to that spew. And just moving forward, you know, we're continuing to reach people with our sites for all those that participate and show up to these webinars. Thank you. And uh, they're recorded, so if you don't get a time to show up to a live session, you can always go online and check them out. And also, um, we didn't have a mentor or mentee of the quarter, but I got a good idea um, who it might be, but I'm also open to suggestions, uh, especially yours, Dante. Um, you, you've been with us since day one, uh, bro, and I appreciate it. Um, so if you if you know somebody, a, a story of somebody out there doing great things that needs some recognition, uh, we're definitely willing to feature them on our site um, and, uh, you know, just uh, let everybody know about some positivity that's taking place out in the world. And as always, we try to lead with recommendations. Um, here's a good book, The Starfish and the Spider, and it's talking about um, how to build businesses, you know, and what constitutes a business and what constitutes um, something that's uh, going to fall to the wayside um, if you haven't multiplied yourself correctly. So here's a good book. You can get it on Google Play, and you can get it at uh, most bookstores, Barnes and & Nobles, and so on and so forth. Um, so check that one out. 
And again, be mindful about the difference between reasons and excuses and don't allow a reason to become your excuse, especially uh, when we talk about things like our timeline here in America. Yes, we were slaves. Yes, we were discriminated against. Um, and that's the reason. We need accountability by both us and them, and we need some more time to get ourselves uh, to where we need to be. I mean, there's no getting around that. These are the facts here. But don't allow that to become your excuse. Never allow that to become your excuse as to why you're not carrying yourself the way you should be carrying yourself, why you're not trying as hard as you can. And when it comes to external accountability, education is the key, you know, in the words of, of Malcolm X. Educate yourself and affect change from the inside. And I know it's difficult, um, you know, and there's a lot of obstacles that have been laid in place out for you throughout history, but those are all excuses uh, when the real reason is we need accountability by both us and them, and we need a little bit more time, and we definitely have to uh, respect that resource called time. It's our most precious resource. Maximize it. Don't waste it, you know, because you can do a lot of things with, times if you, with time if you apply it wisely. Um, and this concludes, you know, the, the formal piece of this webinar. As always, I'm going to leave it recording uh, for the next few minutes. If any of you guys uh, want to share any thoughts, so just uh, chop it up for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, what was, real quick, what was this year's challenge? You know, every year they have a, they come out with some silly challenge, you know, ice bucket challenge or something, something out there. I said, I think I saw the uh, latest. Lately, I've seen the um, "I'm So Gone" challenge. Uh, that's like a singing and rapping challenge. I don't think I've seen no other ones though. I, I think I think you know it's uh, what's where we're in second quarter, third third quarter of the year. You're ready to go into fourth quarter. I think yeah. for the holidays we should do um, tech um, broaden your horizons challenge or a tech challenge and challenge okay. ourselves to invest in resources to better ourselves. Instead of buying your kid the latest pair of J's, get the latest tablet. Get get the tools necessary to better yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're necessary to show up to our webinars also because <laughs> we're putting out some good stuff here, man. Hey, hey what I'm going to do is um, how would you feel about being a, a site admin on the uh, social media sites? De definitely. Okay, I, I'll make you an admin um, this evening and, you know, Take the lead, man, and I, you know I support it 100%. Will do, will do. Yeah, that, that's a that's an excellent idea. We definitely need to uh, put out a challenge and get it out there um, to to promote, you know, bringing out the good. But uh, man, it's it's been been good as always, man. Hearing from you guys, I just got to uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, so um, yeah, I'm gaining my bearings here, and uh, probably in the next. Uh, couple months when we do the next quarterly, um, I'll be looking for you guys' ideas and insight. Definitely. I got I got a few got a few things. I've been in my notebooks and whatnot and observing observing us. I got some stuff I want to put together and put out to the group. Some um Okay. And I know really uh Jabari's in Germany right now. He couldn't make it uh today, but he's gonna share some stuff too. And he's got uh three other people who wants to come in and be guest speakers. Yeah, I've got I've got a few colleagues in the building where I'm at that um I'm surprised I didn't see them online. Well, one of the guys he's like he's so old he doesn't use social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know how that goes, man. Hey, yeah. AJ, uh, how you feel about all of this stuff? Yeah, he's probably hello. Yeah, you there? Yeah. Yeah, you get anything out of this? Um, so far right now, I'm just listening. Okay. Just listening. Ain't nothing wrong with that, man. Yeah, if you if you ever want to uh, share your thoughts, feel free to do that, too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the recorder, and I appreciate you guys coming out. And um, this one will be posted... Uh, on the website probably in the next few hours. And Dante, look for that uh, admin invite. All right. All right, you guys, thanks for showing up, taking yep. your time.